Hello, my name is Ann Lewis. I am the Special Projects Director at the South Dakota Discovery Center in Pierre, South Dakota. In 2017, I was selected as a National, Ge National Geographic Lindblad Grosvenor Teacher Fellow, and National Geographic sent me courtesy of Lindblad Expeditions to the Arctic, and there I got to sail around the top of the world and bring that experience back to my teaching and my community. I'd like to share a little bit of that experience with you, particularly as it pertains to my experiences around climate change. In June of 2017, I boarded a plane in Rapid City, South Dakota, and we flew, or I flew from uh, Rapid to Oslo. There I met up with the other two Grosvenor teacher fellows. Um, we joined up with the other guests, and then we all flew to Svalbard, which is an island way up here. We boarded a ship and sailed around Svalbard, we tried to go towards Greenland. Uh, we couldn't, and we'll get into that in a bit. So instead, we stopped at Jan Mayen, proceeded to Iceland, sailed around Iceland for a bit, and disembarked there. This was our home for two and a half weeks, the National Geographic Explorer. Not a huge ship, room for about 140, 150 guests plus staff. Another view of the ship this is the bridge up here. I want to draw your attention to this zodiac. We would get into the zodiacs and they were used to shuttle us to shore. Uh, most days after breakfast and or lunch, we would ride in the zodiacs and go to shore and hike. Room for about eight to 10 adults, a uh, driver in the back standing up. So if you can just take a moment and think about how big that might be, because we're gonna use this for scale later on. This is an Arctic landscape, uh, Edge Island. And I want to draw your attention to a few things it is the stratus fog clouds, um, mountains in the background, the dark soil, basalt rock, uh, the snow, a little bit of vegetation, not much. And then this bird over here, this is an Arctic tern, and they are extremely aggressive because they nest on open ground. And the only way they have to protect their fledglings and their eggs is to attack any threat, including us. Um, they've been known to draw blood on polar bears, and they're also known for flying from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back. More Arctic scenery and animals. These are caribou, whelks, a whelk is a kind of sea snail, a gastropod. I was getting a little arty with my walrus photos, but I wasn't just trying to make art in taking these photos. I was actually doing field studies. I had decided before I left that I wanted to do a series of field studies in the Arctic uh, that I could also do back in South Dakota. So one of the things I decided to do was to take photos of the plants and animals and upload them to iNaturalist. iNaturalist is a worldwide citizen science platform where anyone can upload their sound files or their photos of the plants and animals nearby. And so you get this worldwide inventory of species. I also had quite a few other field studies in mind, I had planned and packed for, but uh, what I did not realize was that I would be in polar bear country. And in polar bear country, we had to stay in these tight little groups. We had to stay with a naturalist, all of whom when we were on shore carried rifles because polar bears hunt people. By the way, roses. So I was able to, take photos for iNaturalist, um, wasn't able to do like the transects or the soil studies. But another field study I could do was to take surface temperature. And surface temperature is just that, it measures the temperature of the surface. Here I'm measuring the temperature of the surface of a very mossy surface, four degrees Celsius, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, used an infrared thermometer. and that turned out to be really fortuitous because surface temperature is a great way to understand the incoming solar energy to a system, or another way to put it is to understand how much the sun is heating up the earth's surface. 
the sun, and again, I knew this, but I didn't know this um, until I got in the Ar to the Arctic. Um, the sun is very different. The experience with the sun is very different in the Arctic than it is in the temperate zones and definitely in the tropical zones. In the Arctic, you have 24 hours of daylight and 24 hours of darkness throughout the course of a year. When you do have daylight, the sun is low in the sky. And then what sun does come in, uh, a lot of it is reflected back out by the ice and snow. So let's unpack each of these, go a little deeper. This is uh, another photo or map taken from um, above the earth. And this blue purpley circle is the Arctic Circle. And the Arctic Circle is the point on the globe where the sun does not set on the first day of summer, the summer solstice, and it does not rise on the first day of winter, winter solstice. So on the two solstices, you have either 24 hours of daylight or 24 hours of darkness. And then as you go farther north, that period around the solstices of all light or all dark gets longer and longer and longer until you hit the North Pole and then you have six months of light and six months of dark. So in the, at the North Pole, the light begins on the first day of spring when the sun rises and the light ends on the first day of fall when the sun sets. Now, that light and dark, it's not the temperate kind of light and dark, night and day. Uh, when the sun rises on the first day of spring in the uh, at the North Pole, it's not like it's full sun, it's all the way up. It just barely gets above the horizon. And then every day thereafter, it gets a little bit higher, a little bit higher without going down. No dusk, no twilight, just keeps getting higher and higher until the first day of summer. And then it begins going back down until the first day of fall, and it goes just below the horizon. So it gets lower and lower and lower. So in addition to 24 hours of sunlight, uh, a lot of that sunlight is actually kind of twilight quality. I was there during the 24 hours of daylight, and keep in mind that with those 24 hours of daylight, there's an equal amount of time where there's no light coming in, but I was there during the daylight, 24 hours of daylight. And this is what it looked like at midnight and at 3 p.m. This is the 3 p.m. photo. This is the midnight photo. I'll be honest, it was kind of freaky. Now, when the sun is out in the Arctic, it's very low in the sky. If you think about a winter sun and how low that is and how weak the rays feel, how it doesn't feel like it warms very much. Uh, that's an Arctic sun, a summer sun. I have this diagram here of the altitudes of the summer sun um, here, South Dakota, and the summer sun, first day of summer in Longyear Bean's fall bard. Longyear Bean is where we boarded the ship. You can see in Longyear Bean, much, much lower, less intense rays, more diffuse. So when you do have sun coming in and the sun isn't very intense, a lot of it is reflected right back out on the ice and snow. The sun, when it hits the darker parts like the ocean here or the rock back there, uh, that visible light is absorbed and warms up the surface. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but for now, that works. So in this picture, there's a lot of sunlight, but there's not a lot of warming happen happening. All of these conditions combine to create what is, for me, the most compelling and fascinating aspect of the Arctic, and that's the ice. If you had told me before I went that you would fall in love with the ice, I wouldn't have understood it, and, and I don't think I would have believed you. But there you go. Let's look at the ice while I was in the Arctic. There are two kinds of ice. Uh, there's sea ice. And keep in mind that the North Pole does not have any land mass, unlike the South Pole. It's just ocean. And then we have land ice right here. And that's the more brilliant. So this is Greenland. You can see the sea ice, uh, land ice on Svalbard. 
you can see why we couldn't get to Greenland. We ran into sea ice. And I'll show you some of that in a bit. This is a glacier. A glacier is one of the way, ways you can refer to land ice. And glaciers are formed when you have year after year, centuries after centuries of snow and ice accumulating. So it gets higher and higher. The accumulation outpaces the melting. And you get so much that it gets heavy and it begins pushing down and it pushes the glacier, spreads it out and it keeps pushing it and carving the land till it hits the ocean. And here, this glacier is a tidal tidewater glacier. It's right up against the ocean. And when that happens, chunks will start to fall off. And that's called calving. Here you can see um, some ice that's fallen off the glacier. These glaciers are massive. Remember I asked you to think about the zodiac right there. That's a zodiac in front of a glacier. The parts of a glacier that calve off, the big ones, the big chunks, those are called icebergs. So icebergs are land ice that are now, is land ice that is now bobbing around in the ocean. Probably the most famous iceberg is the one that Titanic hit. Uh, we had, I don't know, incident with an iceberg, an interaction. We'll call it an interaction with an iceberg on our ship. I took this video. Um, we had stopped and that day's activity, that's uh, morning's activity, I believe it was morning, was kayaking instead of going to shore in the Zodiacs. They opened up the side of the ship, set up a dock and um, could kayak. Well, there was this iceberg that was bobbing around and it was sort of heading towards the dock. So Casper came over in the Zodiac and I got fit footage of him trying to move it. They don't have these kind of problems in tropical waters. No, they don't. He said they don't have these kinds of problems in tropical waters. I want you to look at the color of the ice that's formed by the compaction and how the molecules get so tightly arranged. It impacts, impacts the way the light is reflected and refracted. I also want you to notice how the motor is churning up sediment. That is glacial flour. Uh, as the glaciers move over the surface of the earth, it grinds up some of that dark basaltic rock we saw earlier, and it washes it into the ocean. Let's go to next. So glaciers just don't break off. Uh, they can also melt. So we were sailing by this glacier and I was standing at the top of the ship uh, when we sailed by this. You can, it was huge, another massive glacier. And I noticed how the glacial melt water was running off and it was creating a waterfall. So even though the sun isn't that intense, it is still warm enough to melt glaciers. Okay, I wanted to show you something very quickly. Uh, it was sort of a way I came to understand uh, land ice. So you always hear about how in the Arctic, climate change is causing sea level rise. Well, that is happening because of the land ice 
falling into the ocean. That's a really simplified explanation, but here's an example. Here's our ocean. And I'm gonna put some, land, some glacial ice in it. Now, formerly this was on the land, and now it's in the ocean. And when this ice ends up in the ocean, it raises the level of the ocean. Now, this ice is in here as icebergs, ice cubes, icebergs. As those icebergs melt, it's not going to get any higher. The ice displaced the water. And so whatever minuscule rise happened when the glacier fell in, that's all it's going to rise. Melting glaciers is like adding liquid water. So it was kind of interesting for me to see that process firsthand. The other kind of sea ice we experienced was, uh, the other kind of ice was sea ice, yes. And sea ice is formed when the surface of the sea freezes. I told you that we sailed through sea ice and um, right down around Greenland, I took this video. I went to the front of the ship and just leaned over to explain some of the production values and documented us sailing through sea ice. Pretty compelling stuff. The picture I took prior to the video uh, was actually of walruses. And one of the reasons sea ice is so important is because it, it's habitat. Here we see two walruses lounging. It's habitat for seals, it's habitat for birds, it's habitat for even kinds of certain algae. It's also habitat for polar bears. Polar bears hunt on sea ice. And as you hear about the sea ice getting thinner, about there being a shorter season of sea ice in the Arctic, that means polar bears have fewer opportunities to hunt. And in fact, we saw this. The naturalist told us that this is a juvenile polar bear that had starved. And, you know, honestly, I don't know if this polar bear starved because of climate change. Uh, so, but what I do know is that this kind of thing is going to be happening more and more as there's less and less sea ice. So I look at this as representative of climate change, being representative of climate change rather than being evidence of climate change. I had said earlier that I did a lot of surface temperature uh, monitoring, taking temperatures. And one of the ways I did that was actually on the ship. So I want to go ahead and share my map and show you two data points where I took surface temperatures on the ocean. So we were up here, zoom in a little bit. 
And what I did was I, le as we were sailing through ice, I would lean over with my infrared thermometer and take the temperature of the ice. And as we were sailing through dark water, I leaned over and took the temper the dark temperature of the dark water. Probably not the most scientifically rigorous field study, but it was informative because as you can see, the ice is colder than the water. Or more importantly, the water, the dark water, is warmer than the ice. And as there's more and more dark water and less and less ice, there's more and more warming happening. I did repeated the same experiment or study down in um, there near the tip of Greenland. That's where I filmed the video. Same findings. Ice is colder than open water. I share these things with you because this made a difference to me in how I thought about climate change. It became a lot more personal, a lot more experiential. So I'm more motivated to care about it, to understand it, and to do something about it. And I hope that it inspires you as well. It's not too late. It can still make a difference. Thank you for sharing my Arctic experience with me. And I hope you go out and have adventures that impact you too.